Our food system is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions that are causing climate change. Climate change results in more extreme and unpredictable weather patterns that in turn impacts our food and agricultural system. Let's explore this cycle and the connections between food, agriculture, and climate. Our modern food system is heavily centralized and controlled by a few major corporate actors. This results in our food system being characterized by land degradation, monocultures, heavy chemical inputs, concentrated animal feeding operations, high food miles, extensive food waste. Growing crops requires significant amounts of land. The demand for cropland often leads to the clearing of rainforests, wetlands, and prairies, which are then replaced with monoculture crops. Rainforests, wetlands, and prairies are all natural carbon sinks, which mean they absorb carbon dioxide. And this is a good thing. When we emit high amounts of carbon dioxide, our natural systems have a way of absorbing the excess carbon in the atmosphere. When we destroy these natural spaces, we not only destroy the Earth's ability to capture that carbon dioxide, but in the process, we release significant amounts of carbon dioxide that have been captured all at once when we clear the land. In place of these biodiverse natural systems, we now grow monocultures. Monoculture is the cultivation of a single crop in a given area. Fields are planted with monocultures as a way to increase efficiency or maximize profits. But sadly, monocultures degrade soil health by depleting nutrients from the soil. Planting the exact same plant season after season leads to a loss of nutrients in the soil. An alternative to this would be to practice crop rotation, meaning alternating crops for each harvest to keep the soil healthy. When soil degrades, it loses its ability to absorb carbon dioxide. This is a significant problem because carbon dioxide levels are steadily rising, leading to climate change. Additionally, soil degradation results in the use of more chemical inputs each growing season because the soil becomes less fertile. It's important to note that monocropping can occur on both conventional and organic farms. As we mentioned, soil degradation often means more chemical inputs, like pesticides and fertilizers are now needed. Chemical fertilizers are produced through an energy-intensive process that releases high quantities of greenhouse gases. Over-application of nitrogen-based fertilizer to cropland also produces greenhouse gas emissions. Specifically, when more nitrogen fertilizer is applied than what crops can actually take up and use, the excess is broken down in the soil and can become the gas nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide has a far greater global warming potential than either methane or carbon dioxide, meaning it traps more heat in the atmosphere. Another consequence of using high amounts of chemical inputs is the adverse health impacts it brings to farm workers who are exposed to these chemicals. A report from 2013 indicated that an estimated 5.1 billion pounds of pesticides are applied to crops each year, and thousands of farm workers experience the effects of acute pesticide poisoning, including headaches, nausea, shortness of breath, or seizures. Pesticide exposure leads to chronic health problems such as cancer, infertility, and other reproductive problems, neurological disorders, and respiratory conditions. Finally, the combination of degraded soil and high chemical inputs result in runoff. In farms across the Midwest, pesticides often run off farms, make their way to the Mississippi River, and eventually end up in the Gulf of Mexico where there is a growing dead zone. This dead zone, approximately 6,334 square miles, is an area of low to no oxygen where fish and marine life are unable to live, and is a result of excess nutrients from farms that end up in upland watersheds and eventually drain down into the Gulf of Mexico.
One of the biggest sources of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions is industrial-sized factory farm operations, also known as concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. In particular, livestock such as cows produce methane emissions when they digest food, and also produce large amounts of manure which also emits methane. CAFOs are associated with many other environmental and social harms. They are inhumane places for animals, often have terrible working conditions for workers, and produce health-harming air and water pollution that adversely affect those living in surrounding areas. CAFOs can house several hundred to millions of animals in a single location and contribute to over 7% of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. There are plenty of ways to raise livestock that are more humane, earth-friendly, and more healthy for consumers. Food miles is the distance food is transported from the time of its making until it reaches the consumer. A lot of food consumption is a high carbon footprint that's especially likely if the food arrived by air due to the high climate impact of planes. When we consume food, we are also consuming resources needed to transport many of those goods around the world. We have grown accustomed to eating fruits and vegetables that are not in season all year round without thinking about where the foods were grown to be able to reach our plates. It's estimated that meals in the U.S. travel about 1,500 miles to get from farm to plate. Globally, we waste about 1.4 billion tons of food every year. Americans discard more food than any other country, nearly 40 million tons, or 30 to 40 percent of the entire U.S. food supply. Wasting food not only is a waste of the water and energy it took to produce it, but when food waste is disposed of in landfills, it releases high amounts of methane. Wasted food generates 11% of the world's emissions, and food takes up more space in U.S. landfills than anything else. Through composting programs and closed-loop cycles, we can drastically reduce our food waste. As you can see, all of these factors contribute to climate change. And in turn, this very system is vulnerable in the face of climate change. Where farmers used to have a diversity of crops and a diversity of crop species, now industrial farms are characterized by monocrops of the same crop species. For example, Mexico grows 59 varieties of indigenous corn and Peru 55 varieties. But the United States grows under 10 varieties, the most common of which by far is yellow corn. 90% of the corn in the United States is grown from a single company's genetically modified seeds. Large agricultural businesses like Cortiva, Monsanto, Tyson's, Syngenta, and others have attempted to maximize profits and efficiencies in a way that has gotten rid of seed varieties. What ends up happening is that we no longer cultivate different crop varieties. Some crop species may be suited for drought conditions, some for flooding, some more resistant to pests, but now we are left hoping that the few crop species that we do grow will withstand all the climatic changes that will come. Climate change may affect the production of corn as early as 2030 under a high greenhouse gas emissions scenario. According to a new NASA study published in the journal Nature Food, corn crop yields are projected to decline 24%. Besides crops being impacted, livestock also suffer as temperatures increase. Heat-related stress means fewer animal pregnancies as well as less milk production, and livestock take a longer time to reach market weight. With higher temperatures, we also see more pests which can mean more diseases spread by insects. And of course, higher temperatures mean higher risk to farm workers who face heat exposure. Our modern agriculture system is highly centralized. This means California agriculture supplies one third of the vegetables in the US and two thirds of the country's fruits and nuts. In recent years, California has experienced severe drought conditions wildfires, and seawater intrusion. 
This combination of reduced groundwater levels, destroyed crops, and saltwater intrusion leads to crop prices going up for consumers. And on the other hand, climate change also leads to extreme weather events, including torrential downpours. These downpours lead to soil erosion, runoff, and can mean crop destruction. All of these climate-related weather events, such as droughts, floods, heat waves, affect crops and livestock. While it's true that carbon dioxide helps crops grow, carbon dioxide also helps weeds and invasive species grow as well. As we continue to degrade our soil through monocropping and heavy chemical inputs, our food also is becoming less nutritious. We can start by decentralizing our food system and growing food more locally. Did you know that currently four companies control 85% of the beef industry in the US? This does not lend itself to a very resilient system and we need to break these monopolies. We can also grow food using organic and natural growing methods. This includes practices that do not use chemical inputs Rather, they rely on natural pest management. This also includes implementing crop rotations and cover crops and building up healthy soils to act as carbon sinks. We can learn what crops and plant species are local to our areas and eat seasonal foods. We can learn where our food comes from. And we can reduce waste by composting and creating closed loop systems. We can adopt more sustainable eating habits, whether that's eating a more plant-based diet or eating locally grown foods or supporting small-scale farms and farmers. Decarbonizing our food system will ultimately build resilience. If we center principles of justice and ecology, we can also ensure long-term benefits for ourselves, our communities, farm workers, and animals. Decarbonizing our food system is key to a more sustainable future.